Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. Currently we are working on integrating the game engine into the level editor and in the previous few episodes we prepared the editor by introducing material assets and shaders. We also managed to initialize the engine from within the editor. However, while trying to initialize the graphics module, we encountered a problem with exporting symbols that are picked up by the application loader and are used to select a specific version of DirectX Agility SDK. We solved this issue by replacing the native host application of the level editor, and although that worked, there's a far better and simpler solution that's been made available by Direct3D's development team. So today I'd like to spend a few minutes reverting what we did in the last video and use the new method to select the Agility SDK. We start by removing this post build event that builds the C++ project for our custom native host. We also remove this line that prevents Visual Studio Debugger from using the default native host. In the debug options, we added a new profile that specified which executable we want to use for launching the .NET application. We are going to revert it back to how it was before. The previous default profile can be found in launch settings JSON file. So all we have to do is copy it from here and paste it over the current one. That's all we have to do in order to use the default application launcher again. However, we also added an icon for the editor and I'd like to keep using it. So let's copy the file to a new resource folder for icons and use it for the editor. After copying the file, we can remove the entire editor host folder. This knowledge hasn't been lost since we can always recover the code from the Git repository. We can set the icon in the project settings of the editor, where I also upgrade the .NET target framework to version 9 in order to use a few new features that were added in c 13. And here we choose the icon for the editor. We can build and run the editor, and of course now the issue with the Agility SDK is happening again. The new solution to this problem is relatively simple and can be done in a few lines of code during DirectX initialization. Therefore, we need to make our changes in d3d12core.cpp, where we also have these symbols. Now instead of exporting them like this, we can make them into constants that are passed to a new DirectX interface function. The interface that we use for this is id3d12 SDK configuration 1. With this interface we can select the SDK version that we want to use and it also provides us with a device factory for creating D3D12 devices using the selected SDK version. Therefore anywhere we are calling the D3D12 create device function we'll use the factories function instead. In order to create the factory we first acquire a pointer to the SDK config interface. Then we call create device factory with the SDK version number and the path to the Agility SDK version which we would like to use. We already saw how we can create a device with this factory. In order to get a debug interface, we have to call another function of the device factory. And here is one more place where we create the main device used by the low-level renderer. The new interface pointers are released when the renderer is shut down. One final adjustment is that we can't use the root signature serialization function since it's tied to the default D3D12 SDK. For this we need the device configuration interface which we can get from the main device. This interface provides a function for serializing the root signature. And that's all we have to do in order to initialize the renderer with a specific version of the Agility SDK. Obviously doing it this way will work regardless of how we are launching the engine, be it standalone or loaded as a DLL by the editor. <laughs> 
One small issue that we get when we try to build the engine project is that the identifier keys we used for acquiring the SDK config and debug interfaces can't be found by the linker, which is causing a couple of unresolved external errors. This is because of the way these keys are defined, which are basically GUIDs put together with this macro. However, this macro only does something when init GUID is defined, and for some reason it's not defined on my system. In case where it's not defined, then the macro just declares an external constant, which can't be found by the linker. After doing a bit of searching on DirectX Discord server, it appears that these GUIDs are exported by DX GUID library in the Windows SDK. So providing this library to the linker should solve the problem. However, I couldn't find a way to check if it also contains the GUIDs for the latest Agility SDK. Therefore, defining init GUID manually in d3d12core.cpp seemed to be the better option for now. Adding this line takes care of the problem and once again we can launch the editor and initialize the engine successfully. Also, we can still run the test application with our scene as well. And that's all it takes to tackle that problem. Thanks again to Matthias for informing me about this solution. While we are here working in the engine code, let me quickly fix a little bug that was reported on Primal's GitHub page. Here we see a few issues reported by the community members, which I think is really awesome, because it makes me realize that I am not doing this all alone. So thanks to everyone who is contributing to making Primal a better engine. The issue that I'll fix today is this one, where these assertions wouldn't fail if the index value equals the size of the arrays, which is obviously incorrect. Thanks again for reporting this. Ok, let's do one more, which happens when the project is on one drive, then the temp folder can't be deleted because it's set to read only. Now I don't recommend working on a project on one drive, but the editor should work regardless. The fix is simple and it's done by setting the directory attribute of the temp folder to normal, so that it's no longer read only and can be deleted. It's great that this bug report also includes the solution, which I really appreciate. Alright, I'll leave it at that for today, since we have got a lot of code to implement. Now that we can initialize the engine, we need to be able to upload meshes for rendering. Meshes are attached to each game entity using the geometry component. We already implemented the geometry component in the engine, but we still have to add it in the editor. We can do so by adding a new file in the components folder. Here we'll write the new geometry component class that inherits from the component base class. We'll follow the same scheme used by other components like script and transform components. Please see these videos if you need a refresher on how entities and components are represented in the editor. So we have to implement two abstract methods and a constructor. We also add a data contract attribute so that our data can be serialized and saved along with the project. We specify which geometry asset is used with this component. We can always change the asset, but it needs to start with a valid geometry asset. We don't load the asset file straight away. Instead, we only record its GUID in a property for later use. This GUID will be saved to the project file, so that when we open the project later, it can figure out which geometry asset to load for each geometry component. Since a geometry asset consists of one or more submeshes, we need an array of materials that contain one material for each submesh. This list is also saved to the project file. We don't implement this method today, but we'll add the multi-selection geometry component later in this video. As I mentioned, each submesh needs to be paired with a material in the geometry hierarchy. To make this easier, I'll add a class for each level in the hierarchy, starting at the submesh level. Like I said, it's a simple class that pairs a submesh with an applied material. Since the material can be changed, it needs to be a notifying property and that's why the class inherits from the ViewModelBase class. The next class is at LOD level, which contains the LOD name, threshold, and the list of mesh material pairs. 
None of this is editable, so it can all be done using regular auto properties. And finally, we have the geometry hierarchy itself, which has a name, an icon, and a list of LODs. In the geometry component, we have the hierarchy as a property which can only be set internally. We can acquire the list of materials using a link extension method. Next, we need to upload the geometry data to the engine when a geometry component is added or when we change the mesh asset for an existing geometry component. Let's have a look at adding a geometry component to a game entity. Remember that we can't add or remove components independently from the game entity. When we add a new component, we basically remove the old game entity and all of its components and create a new one. This is by design in order to simplify the bookkeeping of game entities in the engine itself. However, it may change in the future if it proves to be impractical when creating actual games. For now, this is the place where a game entity is created or destroyed. Uploading component data needs to happen before a game entity is created. And the data is unloaded after the game entity has been destroyed. In order to do this, I am going to add two new virtual methods to the component base class. Component types that need to upload any data to the engine can then override these with their specific implementation. Before doing this for the geometry component, we must make sure that we add a new attribute for this component in order for it to be recognized during serialization when we save the project. I am also using the ID type for entity IDs here. Like I said, we load component data before creating the game entity and unload it after we destroy one. When adding a component, we set the entity to inactive, which will remove it from the engine. However, for an entity that was already inactive, we want it to stay that way. Therefore, we need to remember the state it was in before adding the component. As we'll see a bit later in this video, we use the content ID of the uploaded geometry in order to determine if multiply selected game entities are using the same geometry. Since content ID is an integer, we need to add a new method to determine if an array of integers has mixed values or not. For saving the geometry component in the project, we only need to refer to the GUID of the mesh asset that's used. This is available in the uploaded asset instance of the uploaded geometry, which we'll work on in a minute. In addition, we also have to save the relevant data for all applied materials that are used for the submeshes. We'll work on serializing applied materials in the next video. In order to change the mesh asset of an existing geometry component, first we deactivate the game entity. This will unload the geometry from the engine. Then we set the geometry GUID and reactivate the game entity, which will upload the new mesh. We also clear the list of materials, since we can't know if the new mesh uses the same number and types of materials. Now we are ready to implement the load and unload methods. Here we get the asset information using the geometry GUID. If the asset couldn't be found in the asset registry, that means that it's missing somehow and we drop in the default geometry asset, which is just a little cube. Later, we also want to warn the user that the geometry couldn't be found. Then we upload all materials. This might seem odd since we don't have any materials at this point. However, this array may contain materials if the component was unloaded without changing its mesh and is now being reloaded. For example, this could happen when we add a script component after adding a geometry component. At the end, we call a private method that will upload the geometry and assemble the geometry hierarchy and the used materials.
Here I added the mesh asset name to the geometry metadata as well. This may look complicated, but really we are just filling in constructor parameters for each level in the hierarchy. In the last line, we use elements from the materials list for as long as it contains materials. Otherwise, we create and upload the default applied material and use it instead. We do this using a new method, which is pretty trivial. Finally, the unload method updates the material list and unloads each material. Then the geometry is unloaded and we reset the properties accordingly. The content ID of the uploaded geometry can be accessed using a new property. We are pretty much done with the geometry component, so let me double check for any typos and mistakes. Here the material can't be null and I also add a new assertion to make sure that the material was uploaded before being used here. Also if we already had a material, we unload it before assigning a new one. And this method can be static. Okay, I think that's about everything for now. Let's add the multi selection component next. Again, this is the same approach as for other components. Here we don't have any properties to update, so this method always returns false. And here we check if all selected components used the same mesh asset using the helper method that we wrote earlier. If all selected components refer to the same mesh, then we can use the same property for the geometry hierarchy to be accessed by the UI. And setting a new mesh for the selected components happens here. And that's everything for today's video. In the next video, we are going to make sure that we can save applied materials along with the geometry component in the project file. As always, thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time.